Alan, we're going to move to another medicine, um, uh, another study known as the CORRECT trial, and really a very important breakthrough for us in colorectal cancer, a TKI finally makes it. Describe the study and its importance. Right, so it, it is important because uh, TKIs have gone to colorectal cancer it, it, to, the, to, their, to their death, and this is an example of a TKI that worked. The, the CORRECT trial was in essentially refractory, otherwise unselected patients, patients who'd seen all lines of therapy, who were randomized to regorafenib versus placebo. Uh, really done a rapid accrual, seven, hundreds of 700 plus patients, even some in the United States. I think an accrual in a, my center to a placebo trial at, the, at uh, end stage disease would be extraordinarily difficult, but it accrued even, accrued well more than intended because patients were already in the queue and had consented. And it showed a, an improved survival of 1.4 months with overall survival with regorafenib. Now, Johanna correctly said that there are biomarker curves. In other words, you look at the way the curves diver diverge and you say, ah, there's, there's a patient's benefit and some don't, and we're going to distinguish who they are. I thought the correct trial gave us that possibility because it, the curves looked so distinctly uh, that there was a clear cut point between patients, and they have not. There is, at least to my knowledge, there's no evidence of a biomarker that predicts for efficacy. I think it's, a, it's good, you always want to get patients to live longer. The problem with regorafenib practically is the dose of regorafenib is one that most of us don't believe we can use. Uh, in our practice, we actually started half the dose that's used in a study, which is 160 milligrams per day. We use 80 and try to work up. It's a toxic drug. Uh, and in fact, in our center, we are as likely or as not to send patients to a phase one trial as, as to use regorafenib. This is unfortunate because it's, uh, it's, it's out there. Some patients do get benefit. So you're bypassing an overall survival advantage for a phase one study. I think because as an oncologist, our, 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 my, my edict is do no harm, and it's a toxic drug. Having said, And the one they just got, that full theory Herbitux, was a do it, no it, harm regimen? Well, of course, th this, is, this is the tough balance. Now, I can say it, it, it also doesn't shrink cancer. So the problem. Well, neither did second line therapy. This is right? uh, uh, ten percent of the time. So, so this is the, <clears throat> the challenge: is you can't tell if the drug is helping a patient, and yet you're continuing it in the face of toxicity. Now, in some cases where where you have a patient, let's say with a, a cough from, from from pulmonary metastases, where I have a patient whose cough resolved mm. and stayed on regret, had some toxicity but stayed on it for a long time. But I, I believe this is, it's great to have add to our armamentarium. It proves that TKIs can do something in the disease. What's the mechanism? Is this another uh, bevacizumab beyond progression, kind of an anti-angiogenesis? I don't know. But I, I have mixed emotions because here we're selecting, we're enriching, and now we take a drug at the back end that uh, d just takes all comers. And stabilizes 40-something percent of patients and has an OS benefit. So I wonder if we've lost our enthusiasm for new therapies, because your feeling on this is not uncommon, that it's being saved for, you know, pre-hospice instead of being played as a legitimate line card. So maybe just others' thoughts. And we all, I think, do have access to early phase trials. It's what we do for a living. And so I think I'm picking on you because it's, I feel the same about phase one versus regorafenib. Um, where, where, you, this side, what are you guys doing, Heinz? So I think I, think I agree with um, Alan. I think this drug is not for patients in the waiting room of God, okay? Mm. Um, because so that would argue moving it, that healthy, I, fit, third yes, line. Yes, and I think that's one thing. The second is I think we have, this drug can have toxicities, and I think they develop very fast. Mm -hmm. I think to send these patients out with a full dose coming back in two weeks, you will be seeing all the toxicities, um, which may be prevented when you see them earlier or do dose reduction in patients who are borderline performance status. And I think when you do that, you don't run into any more in this extreme toxicity. So I think it's partly also being aware of how to um, approach these patients, follow them up very um, frequently, and you avoid these big peaks on hand and foot and fatigue and all that. So I use it, um, but I'm also in some patients doing dose reductions to start out and uh, titrate up. Um, I think there is interesting data showing 
um, that this drug may have targets which are beyond what we are targeting with any other treatments. Maybe that's one of the reasons, particularly in the microenvironment. But I think we are not at the point yet where we comfortably use it. How long does, did it take us to use Zeloda, dosing, intervals? Do, and I think we are just on the beginning on understanding so how we use it. we need to learn it's new. Johanna, how would you, where, where is it fitting in and then Marlon? I'm in the same place with Alan, is that I would actually send patients, I send patients to trial early anyway, but I would definitely look at phase one options prior to regorafenib, and I think it's just because we've been burned. That 160 milligram dose, I think we've all tried it, and patients get sick. And I So think what do you say to folks who want to use this, who don't have access to, to phase ones? You know, is it, use it? I, I, F you and mitomycin or regorafenib? <laughs> right, so I will, I'll, I'll use regorafenib, I still do, but I do what Alan does as well, is I'll start at 80 and I'll go up rather than starting at 160 and coming down. Sometimes I'll start at 120, but I think 80 is probably the best way to do it, just to get the patient right. used to the dose. This is like giving, you know, half a dose of, you know, oxaliplatin. <laughs> you know, that's it, a lot less toxic too, guys, but are you, aren't you worried that you're not going to have benefit? I definitely am, but I'm also thinking about quality of life as yeah, well. Yeah, but so if that patient life. does, you know, then why do it? I mean, in a way, I'm, I'm being provocative on purpose here. Um, you know, sure, that patient gets to eight weeks without toxicity, but they've progressed. Do you then keep them on and escalate? Well, you, or? Ramp, you ramp earlier than eight weeks, okay. right? So you see the patient But weekly. are you actually ramping? I mean, yeah. I'm hearing a lot of folks saying, yeah, I start low, but never well, end up we, ramping. We, we, we do ramp, but I think, the, of course, you look back at the history of the drug, which is how is a dose chosen? Right. And, and, and the problem is, do you, would you do an 80 versus 160 study? And the answer is you wouldn't. And, and, but you're totally right. I mean, there are other drugs. Its sister drug, serafinib, is very similar in other diseases. You struggle, but as an oncologist, you, you don't want your patient to be passed out in the waiting room from fatigue or have severe skin toxicity. So it's, it is a real challenge to use, to use right. We see patients weekly. We call them twice a week. We have a nurse call them twice a week. And as Hines says, if you leave them, if you leave them three or four weeks, they will come back and they won't. They'll, they'll and it's this early window that's really important. Correct. Once you get them out, it's quieter. I, I think it's important to remember that about 72% of patients on the correct study who got regorafenib required dose reduction, and you really have to put that in the context that the median treatment duration is very short because half the patients were progressors within two months. So you're not talking about patients on drug for eight months and 70% reduction. And I think the other thing to keep in mind is that the study looked at 0-1 ECOG. So really, we have no data that this will help patients who are ECOG 2. So those patients probably should not get the drug. And, and, but I'm, I'm personally comfortable with, with 120. I'm not really sure I would want to use an 80. I think that's, we, we don't have any hint of efficacy with 80 that we know of to start with. And, and if, it's, if I'm worried enough about a patient to start at 80, that patient probably should not be on regorafenib. Well, I'm thinking that my initial experience with this drug is we were in the extended access program. And so I had all these patients, you know, dying to get on this trial. And so by the time we got drug, they were PS2 and 3 and then it didn't work and they were more spicy. And so I think that, that has colored in some ways my, my opinion. And, and again, having this phase one bias and, and all of that, um, but you know, and, and a person who doesn't have access to all of those, I think part of the message is watch the dose. Um, it's a legitimate third line treatment, um, depending on see the or and not. See the patient often. Watch them close, yeah. don't just send and, them off. Right. Um, and, and, and one thing I would like to add is that I, I think we, when we discuss this drug with patients, it's very important mm. to talk about risk benefits. Because mm. you'd be surprised some patients have rejected this drug. Yeah. And, and I think this is one of the drugs that, that I've seen more patients say, no, thank you. Yeah. than any other agent. Right, and I'm using uh, the 40% mark. I'm saying, okay, well, it's stabilized in about 40% of patients if we can get you to eight weeks to see if you're one of those 40. And, you know, that's, and, but I agree with you. These are patients who are uh, fairly far along in their battle. They've thought about end of life, and they're trying to decide it's, about it's, these things. They value that toxicity uh, risk benefit, as you mentioned more. I mean, the truck came very quick. It did. And I think we, we have not enough experience. You know, when you look at the CHIST doctors, they use it all the time. They have almost no problems with that because the patients are different, the experience is different, the benefit is different. So I think we will learn to use this drug when we monitor the patients adequately. So I'm not too worried about it. Obviously, the risk and benefits need to be always discussed with the patient.